The Something You Should Know podcast today is sponsored by Audible.com. Did you know you can actually get a free audiobook download and free 30-day trial with no obligation simply by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Today on Something You Should Know, who knew math could be so much fun? Think of a number between 20 to 50, okay? And whatever number you're thinking of, add the digits together. So if you thought of 42, then 4 plus 2 is 6. Now take that total and subtract it from your original number. So now you should be thinking of a two-digit number that even you didn't know you'd be thinking about. And I want you to add the digits of that number together. And if my magic powers are working right now, you should be thinking of the number nine. Plus the amazing accuracy of first impressions made in less than a second. And a new way to look at commitment. So when people say that they're afraid of commitment or, gosh, I don't want to be stuck with a commitment, I think what they're imagining is obligation. I think if they thought about commitment from an internal choice of I'm following and sticking with what I value and what brings my life meaning, why would you ever be afraid of that, right? All this today on Something You Should Know. Something You Should Know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Hi, welcome to the podcast. Uh, An episode or two ago, I I asked if you had a moment, if you could uh, drop me a line just to let me know how you found this podcast, because I'm I'm always interested in how people find podcasts anyway, but but mine mine in particular. And I got some great responses, uh, several great responses of interesting ways people have come across either finding it on iTunes on the on the charts or on other uh, there's an Android app that has us on the charts there and um, uh, but however you find it if you do have a moment to drop me a note and just let me know I, I'd really be interested to know how you just happen to come across the podcast and you can email me at Mike at something you should know dot net all spelled out Mike at something you should know dot net now here's an important question how would you rate your own health? Excellent, very good, good or fair. Chances are whatever you chose, you're probably right. In research at Carnegie Mellon University, people who rated their health as excellent were twice less likely to develop a cold than those people who rated their health as very good, good or fair. It suggests that people who consider themselves to have excellent health have a stronger immune system than those people who have some doubts about their health. Poor self-ratings of health have been found to predict actual health and mortality in adults. Previous studies have focused on things like exercise and diet and how it predicts health and longevity. But this study, this study shows that there's something to actually believing that you're healthy. Perhaps when you believe you're healthy, you're more likely to act that way. But whatever it is, it's clear that having a good attitude about how healthy you are really matters. And that is something you should know. Commitment. It's one of those words that just sounds hard. When you make a commitment to something, you're probably giving up something or sacrificing something else. We think that commitment means hard work. But maybe, just maybe, we need to rethink how we think about commitment And to discuss that is Heidi Reeder. She's examined 40 years of research on the topic of commitment, the result of which is her book, Commit to Win, How to Harness the Four Elements of Commitment to Reach Your Goals. So Heidi, how do you define commitment as it applies to what we're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. We use the term commitment. What I'm talking about is the internal attachment you feel to something, the internal drive that makes you stay with something long term. And so everybody knows what that is. We've all had that feeling, that sense, that that commitment. We've had it. Everybody has had it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think some people think they're afraid of commitment, but I actually think it's one of the most natural things to be committed, to to stay to stay the course to something that's really important to you. And so the trick is to figure out how do we do that with the things that we really value and that are hard to do long term. And so how do we do that? 
Well, you know, a lot of people try to rely on motivation to reach their goals. And so they think, well, you know, if I want to get in shape or if I want to start my own business or something like that, then I've just got to wait for that moment that I'm motivated. Oh, look, I'm motivated today, so I work on it today. Well, what happens tomorrow when I'm not motivated? So what I like to help people do is set their environment up and set their mind up to actually be committed. So even on the days you're not really motivated, you still have that forward motion. Researchers have found that there are four factors that actually predict how committed you'll be. And so what I like to think about is, okay, well, how can we kind of manipulate those factors a little bit to get ourselves in line with what we want to do? All right. Yeah, so, uh, so take me to that step. Okay, great. So the first two are called, I, I call them treasures and troubles. In the old days, you might call them a cost-benefit analysis, right? But you've got to really treasure the commitment, this relationship, this job, starting your own business, you know, being able to do the triathlete. You've got to really treasure that at a higher level than you feel troubled. And so we talk with folks about, okay, so how can we do that? How can we focus more on what we value about this than we're spending our time focusing on the difficulties? Once we've got that you know, under control. We're going to be satisfied and that will kind of maintain us at a certain level. But the next thing we need to do is start contributing at a high level. Researchers have found that where we make contributions, we stick with it. We've put a part of our time, our energy, our money, whatever into something, then we want to see it through. Even, I mean, even to a default sometimes, you'll see yourself sticking with something that maybe doesn't even make sense anymore based on what you've already put into it. So now how can we use this, you know, to our favor? And then the fourth idea is People get distracted by other choices, and that can take away from commitment. So the fourth factor that helps people be committed that research has found is can they reduce the amount of time that they spend looking at their other options? Oh, that's I like that, because uh, how often do we get distracted by that? Like, yeah, but maybe I should be doing this over here, or maybe I could do that. Maybe this would be better. Oh, completely. And you think, well, that's not going to take away from the current thing that I'm committed to. It completely does, whether it's a relationship, if you're spending a lot of time. I mean, there's hardcore research that shows that if you're spending a lot of time looking at your other options, so to speak, that actually predicts a lower commitment over time to the person that you're with. Same with a project. I mean, if you're working on a current project, you keep fantasizing about all the other projects you could be doing. Oh, maybe that doesn't really take away. Yeah, it actually does. It actually does take away. So what we try to do is set people's environment up so that they can stay focused on what's most important and, and let go of the distractions that may be keeping them from being their best. In, uh, and you mentioned motivation early on, and I think a lot of people think too, or maybe it's just another way of saying it, but that, that, that willpower is what will pull you through and that, and that, but willpower comes and goes. Well, right, exactly. And, 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 you know, all power to willpower, right? I mean, that's, that's great. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you didn't have to rely on that? Wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of trying to will your way through dinner and eat healthy, because that's sort of an uncomfortable, you know, it's not a whole lot of fun. Wouldn't it be better if you'd, you've actually internalized the value of healthy eating, you really are committed to it. And so it's, you don't have to rely on your willpower. But it's hard to imagine not using your willpower, maybe because we just, we've heard it all our lives that you've got to, you know, you've got to will your way to win. Yeah. And I think, I think, under, I think in some cases that's true. If it's a short term goal, I think willpower will work very well, but imagine trying to use willpower to have a long term relationship. <laughs> that doesn't sound very good, right? Or imagine trying to use willpower to have a successful business for 30 years. I mean, there'll be days where you need to use willpower, but underneath it all, if you have the foundation of commitment, you've set your life up to have commitment, then that willpower is going to be a lot easier to come by. So why do you think that some people seem to handle commitment and follow through and, and all of those things better than others? I think it's because of some of the myths that we have about commitment. So when people say that they're afraid of commitment or, gosh, I don't want to be stuck with a commitment, I think what they're imagining is obligation. I think if they thought about commitment from an internal choice of I'm following and sticking with what I value and what brings my life meaning, why would you ever be afraid of that, right? So I think it's kind of we have to flip that switch in our head that says commitment is for other people and commitment means I'm being a good person in society to, no, commitment means I'm going to get the great greatest value out of my life. I'm not going to be scattered all over the place. I'm going to do one or two things, have one or two, you know, quality relationships, quality jobs, quality projects that I really see through for me. 
And there are those people, though, and maybe this is one of the differences, that, that never can quite put, you know, they've got uh, one foot in the door and one foot out the door, that they just got to keep their options open. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, some of the researchers have looked at this concept of what they call being a maximizer, which means that we keep trying, some, some people who classify, end up being classified as a maximizer, what that means is that they're always looking for the optimal experience, right? So the optimal relationship, not a good relationship, the optimal, right? Not a good job, the optimal job, not a, even buying clothes or something. I can't just get a good t-shirt. I got to get the optimal, right? So whatever they end up with, they're not as satisfied with it and they don't stick with it as much because they keep thinking about all the other options. So it's actually can be healthier in some ways to be what they call a satisficer, which is that I, I, when I finally find something that I'm satisfied with that meets my needs, then I stick with that. Sometimes good enough is good enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it, I'm not saying um, sacrificer, right? I'm not saying sacrificer. I'm saying satisfied. Like, this satisfies me. If I'm satisfied, um, is it going to help me to continue to look at my other options? The research says no. That actually makes you less satisfied. I think, too, people think if, if I'm having trouble making a commitment that, you know, that's a red flag, that, that if, if, it isn't, if it doesn't just fall into place and, uh, and I, it doesn't feel like this is the thing to do, then maybe it's not the thing to do. Absolutely. I think there are some cases, and I talk about this with folks as well, where you actually have to consciously reduce your commitment to something that really isn't working. Sometimes we, we value commitment so much, you know, on the other side of the coin, we value commitment so much that we're going to stick with something even if it's making us miserable, it's not getting us where we want, it's not really lining up anymore with our long-term trajectory. And so it's just as important to be able to what I call decommit uh, from something that's no longer working and, and using some tools to do that and having that be okay. And then commit to something new that's more in line with, with your, your, your purpose. So how many commitments can you have at any one time? You know, that's a really great question. The research on goals says that if you try to have too many goals at the same time, you won't be as successful. We seem to do better when we can take on one thing at a time. And so if you're one of those people where you're like, I'm going to, be, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to give all my attention possible to my kids and... You know, you'll invariably, I mean, unless you're really an astounding person <laughs> with more time than the rest of us, you'll, you'll invariably start to fail at some of those things, and then you'll feel like a failure. Whereas if you just take one goal at a time and really get that honed in and then move on to the next one, people tend to be more successful. But you can't focus on your commitment at work and ignore your wife and ignore your kids. No, <laughs> no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't advise that at all. One of the things about commitment that, that is also a myth is that you're either committed or you're not. I mean, we take that for granted, right? You're either in or you're out. You're committed or you're not. Like, are you committed? Yes, no. And what, what the research actually suggests is commitment is more on a sliding scale. And so what we can do sometimes is say, okay, I'm going to be able to be like 90% committed at work, like between zero and a hundred percent. And my home life right now is going to have to be at about 60% because that's just what, that's just where, how it needs to be right now and have that be okay. That a commitment can be higher or lower depending on the circumstances. Oh, well, I think that that's interesting. Cause I think when people think commitment, they think 100%. Absolutely. And because that would be wonderful, right? That you would never have to think about it. You'd never, you know, you're just, you're committed, done. Now, it kind of depends on how you're thinking about commitment. If you're thinking I'm committed to my job means I'm not going to quit my job, then yes, that's, you're either, you either have the job or you don't. But how much effort and energy and focus you put into that, that can be on a sliding scale depending on the other things going on in your life. Oh. Well, that's actually kind of comes as a relief. <laughs> well, yeah, because sometimes people think, okay, I'm not 100% committed, so therefore I'm not committed at all. No, 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 no. And then they freak out, right? So no, 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 no. It's just a little lower today. If that's bothersome to you, then we can talk about some techniques to increase it. And maybe if it's a little lower today, tomorrow, in the next seven days, maybe it's really not a commitment after all. Right. And so it's kind of good to pay attention to that. Pay attention, you know, how, how have, have the circumstances changed? Has something come up that really does make a big difference? And I, sh I should reconsider this commitment. But there are people who claim to be and seem to be committed to, say, losing weight, but they never quite do it. They never quite get there. 
Right. So I think in that case, you have to think about what can I reframe my goal, right? So sometimes people come up with a goal that is so specific that they can't, that it becomes too difficult to achieve and the commitment needs to be reshaped. So for example, one of my students came up with a goal that he was going to work out two and a half hours every day. (laughs) And I thought, this is going to go badly. And so we have to work a little bit on, okay, what's your real goal? In other words, that is the tactic to reach what? My real goal is to be committed to being active, to being healthy, to taking care of myself, to getting outside. Then I can do that in a variety of ways, and I can still be successful even if I didn't reach the specific X that I thought at first was the only way to achieve the goal. Well, that, that works for me. And, and you know, and it takes some of the weight off of commitment, what commitment means, and gives people a new way to think about commitment. So thanks, Heidi. Heidi Reeder, she is the author of the book, Commit to Win, How to Harness the Four Elements of Commitment to Reach Your Goals. There is a link to Heidi's book on Amazon on the show notes page for this podcast on our website, somethingyoushouldknow.net. You know, I've been telling you about uh, Audible.com, and uh, Heidi's book is is an example of a great book that is available as an audio book uh, from Audible. And if you're a first-time user, you can get Heidi's book or any of their other thousands and thousands of titles for free. They have an offer where you get a free month service and one free audio book download, no commitment or obligation, and check it out and see how you like audiobooks. What you do is you go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. And sign up for their free trial and free audiobook download. And then you can listen to the book you downloaded on your phone or your computer or wherever you downloaded it to and see if you don't enjoy, as most people seem to, uh, consuming a book by listening to it rather than reading it. It's a great way to read a book, except you're not reading the book. Anyway, give it a try if you haven't already. It's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K for your free 30-day trial and free audio book download. audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Remember math in school? It was not my strong subject, I'll tell you that. I liked it. I just didn't get it. I don't, my brain just didn't work that way. But anyway, it left me and I suspect a lot of other people with a less than warm and fuzzy feeling about math in general. And how many times have I said, and maybe you've said back then, I'm, I'm never going to need to know this stuff. Well, maybe we missed something. Maybe math is more important and more fun than we realized back then. Here to make the case is Arthur Benjamin, a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College and author of the book, The Magic of Math. And so, Professor, you obviously are one of those people who feels differently about math than I did in school. What's your fascination with math? Well, I've always loved numbers and math for for my entire life, really. Um, But unfortunately, I've seen a trend where we spend more and more time in the classroom talking about fewer and fewer topics. And I think, unfortunately, we've we've, um, left out a lot of the fun and beautiful topics in mathematics. And that's what my book is about. I want you to learn the math that's important, but I also want you to love the math, which is not always the same as the math that's being shown to us in school. Yeah, well, few people, I think, would think back to their school days and think math was fun. Although some do, but but it just, you know, math is one of those things that people get through and complain right. they ne- they'll never need it later in life. And so, and, so talk about the magic. And, and so um, the magic, well, let me just do it. Let me, rather than talk about it, let me do an example for there you. There you go. Okay? So think of the number between 20 and 100. Since we're on the air, say 20 to 50, okay? And um, whatever number you're thinking of, add the digits together. So if you thought of 42, then 4 plus 2 is 6. Now take that total and subtract it from your original number, okay? So so now you should be thinking of a two-digit number that even you didn't know you'd be thinking about. And I want you to add the digits of that number together. And if my magic powers are working right now, you should be thinking of the number nine. Yep. (laughs) Why does that always work? And exactly. Well, first of all, I got you to ask me, why does it work? Which is, you know, a magician wants to hear the audience say, wow, how'd you do it? 
A, a, a mathematician or a mathematician wants you to say, wow, that was cool. Yeah, how, how did you do that? Why does that work? And um, the, the, the basis for this magic here, and I have a whole chapter on it on the magic of, is, is based on the magic of the number nine. And um, it goes back to the fact that you learned in elementary school that the multiples of nine, 9, 18, 27, they all have the property that their digits add to 9. 1 plus 8 is 9, 2 plus 7 is 9. And there's all kinds of math that can be done using this fact. It's called casting out 9s, and it's a lot of fun. Give me another, give me another magical trick. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, here's one I want. So, uh, I want you to think of a birth date, like maybe your own birthday or somebody you know, including the year. Um, what, what year are you thinking of? 1959. 1959. And what month? April. April what? 12th. 12th. That was a Sunday, believe it or not. And, you... and that... <laughs> Go ahead. And that's, again, it's based on the fact that the calendar is mathematical. I mean, math surrounds us every day, every date. And uh, with just a little bit of practice, you can do amazing things, not just in your head, but also, you know, applying math to, to everyday problems, whether it be algebra, geometry, trigonometry. The book even goes up to calculus. But I also want you to learn you know, the, the fun side of math, the mysteries of the number pi, the Fibonacci numbers, the, um, the magic of infinity. That's the last chapter, by the way, because you can't go beyond infinity. No, you can't. So <laughs> what, what is pi, by the way, and wh- why do we yeah. need it, and wh- what's the point, and, and uh, how, mm. go ahead and explain and, pi. Yeah, so, so you see, anytime you see a circle... Um, then you, you are really seeing pi. If you, take, if you measure all around the circle, let's say the, um, the rim of a glass, and you, measure, or, you, know, you take a tape measure and you put it all around the rim of the glass, that's called the circumference. And if you, if you divide by the distance across the, gra- uh, uh, across the glass, that's called the diameter. And no matter how big or small that circle, the circumference divided by the diameter is always this mysterious number, pi, a little bit over 3, 3.14159, etc. And uh, it's, it's a number that mathematicians have studied for thousands of years, and we still find it showing up in unexpected places. But why do we care? Why, so what? Why do we care? Well, um, two reasons. One is um, it, it, it certainly shows up in all branches of mathematics. I mean, if you look at, say, um, uh, not, you know, not just when you're dealing with circles and glasses and circumferences, but also, you know, you look at the bell curve that describes um, all kinds of distributions that show up in the natural sciences. That's based on the number pi. Um, it shows up in probability. It shows up in geometry. Um, but also, it's just a kind of a mysterious number, right? It, it's, um, it's an irrational number, which means its decimals never repeat. At some point, your birthday will show up in the digits of pi, which is kind of, kind of beautiful and surprising. Um, and yet, there's also an answer to that is sometimes we like math not just because we can apply it, but because it is kind of beautiful. Think of it like music. You know, um, sure, music has its applications. It can affect our moods and emotions. But it's just sometimes just pretty and and, and enjoyable to listen to. And once those light bulbs get turned on, once you understand the why behind the math, uh, then then it becomes very addictive. And and math can be just as fun and as exciting as any art form. So respond to what my son tells me all the time, that... I'll never need to know this stuff later, and give me an example of why that's not true. Okay. Well, what, what grade is your son in? What's he learning right now? He's in fifth grade, and they're doing algebra, real simple algebra. Ah, well, then, I mean, there in fifth grade, you're learning about fractions, percentages, decimals, which probably seems very abstract to him now, but, but you, as a working adult, use decimals, fractions, I mean, to understand money, to understand discounts, to understand market share, all those things. I mean, it, it's, you know, and yet to a fifth grader, it seems mysterious. When am I ever going to use this? 
And then the next level up, he's just starting to learn algebra. In algebra, you learn the whole idea of abstraction. You know, the, the idea of letting a variable represent an unknown quantity. Well, if you're going to do something like, say, program computers, you have to be able to deal with that kind of abstraction. You have to be ready for any kind of input that the user gives you. And, and you learn about this idea of abstraction through algebra. Now, I admit, you may go through life and never have to solve the quadratic equation. I mean, I'll, I mean you'll need it in your calculus class and other math classes. But, you know, as a working adult, you probably don't need to know that. But the, the thing is that math teaches you and trains you how to think logically, carefully, critically, and even creatively. Can you give me an example? Uh, because, you know, the, the nine thing is fun and figuring out what day of the year it was, or day of the week a certain sure. date was. But something practical that, that people use math for or could use math for if they knew how to do it? I would say things like being able to estimate, say, what your mortgage payment will be if somebody tells you what the interest rate is or how many payments, how long is it going to take for me to be able to, um, to pay off this loan. Um, you know, whenever you take, uh, whenever you, you, you take calculated risks every day, you know, what time should I leave for the airport? I mean, that's a question that is practical, and yet, you know, you don't want to leave too early, but you don't want to risk missing the plane. And, you know, the, the, the better you understand math, the, the better you actually can do the calculations to, to make sensible life decisions. And so the idea that, you know, we'll never use it again, as you said, it helps you become a better thinker, too, by learning math. Right, and that's right. I don't know of anything that trains you to think more logically than, than learning mathematics. But I also agree that you and your son have a valid question that, the, that you should ask the teachers, which is, when am I going to use this? And if the answer is, you're going to use this only in a future math class, then I say, save it for the future math class. Show me stuff that's interesting right now. And in my experience as a math professor, I find that students respond to, to two things. They respond to relevance and elegance. Either show them math that's real, that they can use and, you know, for problems that, they, they, that they're interested in now or that they might be interested in later, or show them math that's simply beautiful, just fun. I mean, that magic trick that I showed you at the beginning, you're not going to build bridges out of that, but it's just something cool that excites the mind. And, and I think is, is that every math that we teach should be either relevant or elegant. If it's not, then save it for later when it will be relevant. Well, great. Well, I, I like math maybe a little more than I used to. It'll still never be my favorite subject, but I, but I do like it a little more after listening to you. That's Arthur Benjamin. He's a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College and author of the book, The Magic of Math. There's a link to his book on Amazon on the show notes page of this podcast on our website, somethingyoushouldknow.net. Everybody knows that first impressions are important, but they may be more important than you realized. For instance, people can decide on your trustworthiness in as little as one-tenth of a second. In some research, a group of people was given 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, to rate the attractiveness, competence, likability, aggressiveness, and trustworthiness of actors' faces— then they gave another group of people as long as they wanted to rate the same thing, the same people. And the results were very similar. It seems that clothes matter in making a first impression. In a survey, people wearing name brand clothes, Lacoste and uh, Tommy Hilfiger to be precise, those people were seen as having higher status and were perceived as wealthier than people wearing non-designer clothes when they approached 80 shoppers in a mall. If you look at someone in the eye when you meet them, you're perceived to be smarter. And how you hold yourself can express how religious you are. One study at the University of California at Berkeley found that 123 undergrads could accurately assess how religious 113 people were 
simply by looking at full-body photographs of those individuals. Those who appeared to be smiling, energetic, relaxed, and neat were judged to be more religious. And in fact, they usually were. That's our podcast today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please feel free to share this with your friends. I always enjoy hearing from you. My email address is mike at somethingyoushouldknow.net. The podcast today has been sponsored by audible.com. For a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial to their service, go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.